Here we're looking at uh, one of the most amazing and beautiful things seen in nature, yet also somehow one of the simplest. Uh, this is a photograph uh, shot by NASA uh, in April of 2024 during a solar eclipse. There's a shadow through the trees and you see the, the arc of the sun being blocked by the, the moon here. So you can see many, many copies of that through different uh, holes in the tree. Over here where there's, there's uh, nothing blocking the sun, uh, you don't see any real images. So it's the, uh, the pinhole effect created by the leaves that creates the image uh, of the sun. Now you'd think that this uh, ancient and uh, very natural phenomena would not uh, really be uh, amenable to computational imaging, uh, but you'd be wrong. This is a perfect uh, system for us to create and analyze our first digital imaging model. Let's do that. Computational imaging. Episode 20, Pinhole Imaging. All right, let's start talking about optical system design. Uh, we want to measure an object shown over here on the left. We have detectors that are going to make measurements of the radiation field uh, coming from the object. Uh, it could be if we have like a holographic system that we can just directly measure the radiation field. But in most cases, uh, we're going to have to use optics uh, between the object and the uh, measurements to condition our measurements and create our forward model. A simple model of a forward model might be just to say, well, uh, if I have this point B, point B uh, sees the field coming from point A, and if it can see the field, it will detect it. And so you might say, well, it all, why wouldn't all points just detect the field? So I have point C over here. A point C uh, could also uh, detect the field coming from the object. But if there's no modulation in the space, then the measurement at point B and the measurement at point C would be the same, assuming the object's radiating uniformly in, in all directions. Uh, in order to characterize the space, we need some diversity in our measurements. So we would put an obscurant or optical component of some kind to modulate the field so that the measurements at point B and the measurement at point C are different. In this case, assuming that the uh, light from each point in space just radiates uniformly in all directions, uh, we would say that there's a region due to the obscurant that uh, point B can see, but point C cannot. So that would be this, this region here. And then there's a region that uh, point uh, C can see that point B cannot, which would be this region. And then there's a region that's observed by both points uh, B and C. So then the measurements in this system at point B would be uh, the sum of the field uh, from the region that uh, point B can see, but point C uh, cannot, and the region that point B and point C can see. And similarly, uh, point C sees all the regions that it can see. But now we have a, a matrix, basically, that, that we are, our object is conditioned by uh, the radiance from each one of these regions. And we have a linear discrete forward model describing a vector matrix multiplication of those object regions to the measurements. All right, it's like the world's simplest system. We just... Uh, Light radiates in all directions, you can see it or not, and that creates a forward model. This forward model can be generalized into a very complex system. You put a bunch of obscurants in space, that divides the space, and if you have enough obscurants and detectors, then you can invert that and estimate the space. Simple system uh, is uh, discussed in the reference uh, uh, linked here. Uh, that system is actually sufficiently complex to create all kinds of interesting processing uh, issues, and then there'd be all kinds of issues about what would the ideal distribution of obscurance be. It's a complicated enough problem that we're going to leave it for a later discussion in our uh, series of videos. And we do what we often do in these kind of complicated situations, step back to the simplest possible system. What if there's only one pinhole, and so we can get an impulse response of a point in space and create an image? So this is the, the famous pinhole camera or camera obscura. Uh, we're observing an uh, object at range uh, Z uh, on a detection screen at range D behind a pinhole. And if uh, light from the object can get through the pinhole, then we detect it here on the output plane. Otherwise, it's going to be blocked by the screen. So we can create a forward model for this uh, relatively simple system. And let's begin by describing uh, the pinhole. Uh, let's say that it's a circular pinhole so that the transmittance of the function is defined by this circ function that uh, if the uh, radius is uh, less than 0.5 uh, then uh, the, then the uh, transmittance of the circ function is one and if it's uh, greater than 0.5 the transmittance is uh, zero 
So now we can describe a visibility for points in space uh, through this pinhole. If we want to consider the visibility of point uh, x, y uh, in the object plane with point x prime, a y prime uh, in the measurement plane, the visibility is one if the ray uh, projected uh, from x, y uh, to x prime, y prime goes through the, the pinhole, uh, which means the, that uh, it's a uh, intersection point in the measurement plane lies within the radius of the projected pinhole. The, the size of the pinhole increases due to this uh, angular projection uh, by the factor uh, 1 plus uh, d over z in going from uh, the uh, um, pinhole to the measurement plane. So this is our visibility uh, between those points and then we can uh, uh, describe that using the circ function in this form. So the visibility between the points x, y, in the object plane, x prime, y prime in the measurement plane is the scaled version of the circ function as shown here with this adjusted radius due to the projection of the pinhole. So that gives us now our first forward model for a imaging system that uh, the uh, um, measurement data is the uh, integral of the uh, object distribution against the uh, visibility function as the impulse response for the pinhole camera. Now, so that's our that's a computational imaging system. We have a computational model for how the pinhole camera behaves. Uh, in uh, the next lecture, we'll turn it into a discrete model. But for now, we can analyze characteristics of this model and uh, evaluate this as an imaging system. Now, we need to jump ahead a little bit in our narrative here and uh, uh, mention something that will come up in chapter five. Uh, let's suppose we have this pinhole of diameter A. Uh, we've seen that uh, the rays coming through it uh, project a pattern, uh, and the shadow of the pattern will have this with A times 1 plus uh, D over Z. So that's this term. But if we actually uh, imagine that this is a wave coming here, uh, the wave will diffract at the pinhole, and the diffraction will increase the size of the shadow. Uh, the angle of the diffraction uh, will be uh, A over uh, lambda, where lambda would be the wavelength of the incident wave. So the size of the pinhole will increase by this d, the thickness of the pinhole camera, times lambda over a. This gives us the opportunity to say what value of a uh, would um, minimize uh, the delta x, make the maximum resolution in our pinhole. If we make the pinhole uh, larger, then uh, our shadow is smaller, our, impulse our shadow is larger, our impulse response is bigger, and our image resolution will be worse. If we make the pinhole smaller, we could make uh, you know the, the resolution, this uh, circ function, smaller and smaller. Uh, but at some point, that would lead to more wave diffraction. If we make A smaller, this diffraction angle will increase and, and uh, we'll actually be making the pinhole bigger. So there's some optimal value of the pinhole size that will balance uh, the uh, geometric shadow and diffraction. To find that, we would take the derivative of delta x uh, with respect to A which would give us this 1 plus uh, d over z uh, minus uh, d lambda over a squared. Now we could solve this uh, very simple equation for a squared, but one thing we could note is that uh, in most cases, uh, d over z will be much less than 1, that the pinhole camera is uh, uh, much thinner than the range to the object. So if we set that to 0 and solve for uh, the optimal value of a, we get that a is equal to the square root of d, the thickness of the pinhole camera, times lambda, where lambda is the wavelength of the illuminating wave. I'm going to substitute this in. We get the uh, minimum size of the shadow of the pinhole is going to be 2 times a square root of d times uh, lambda. Now, so that's the width of the impulse response, and we've seen that we can beat that, right? That if we use a uh, advanced uh, maximum likelihood estimator, uh, we can estimate a position of an object to better than the width of the impulse response. That's certainly true, and that that kind of res that kind of image resolution could beat the width of the impulse response, but it beats it by a constant factor. So the width of the impulse response is still a good measure of uh, imager system performance. It's just that we recognize that an advanced estimator could might do a little bit better than that. Okay, so this gives us a idea of uh, the forward model of the pinhole and what its performance is going to be uh, as an imaging system. Now, one thing, if we look at this uh, forward model, there's this scale difference between uh, the image space scale, uh, which is going to be this in the space x prime, and the object space, which is multiplied by d over uh, z. So this uh, d minus d over z is the magnification of the image. The image is inverted 
uh, relative to the object and scaled by uh, d over z. And we've just seen uh, that the approximate angular resolution we're going to have in imaging with a pinhole camera uh, is going to be our uh, delta x in the object space divided by the thickness of the pinhole camera. That would be the uh, angle corresponding to, to delta x. And so if our delta x is um, square, two times uh, square root of lambda d divided by d, our angular resolution is uh, two times the square root of lambda d. So let's say that uh, lambda is uh, one micron, 10 to the minus six centimeters. Let's say that d is uh, one centimeter, so it'd be 10 to the minus two. So um, then our um, uh, delta th uh, theta would be somewhere around uh, two, uh, 20 milliradians. Okay, not bad. So that you now a human uh, vision is uh, somewhere in, in, the, in the region of, of uh, uh, 300 microradians. So, so uh, you know, this, this is about uh, a factor of uh, 100 worse uh, than, uh, than human resolution. Uh, and that's because humans use lenses. So we could compare uh, this pinhole camera with uh, something we'll talk about uh, in, the, in the future, which would be imaging with a camera and with a lens. And the lens, let's say, has a focal length f, so the thickness is going to be around f. We will find in the future that the angular resolution for this system goes like uh, lambda over the thickness, lambda over f, basically. Uh, so it's the same as the resolution for a pinhole camera, except without this uh, square root factor. So if the same parameters are put in, we have one micron uh, lambda, one centimeter uh, thickness, our uh, angular resolution would be uh, somewhere in, in the range of 100 uh, microradians. So, uh, you know, a factor of uh, 100 better than what a pinhole camera would be. Which is why, of course, that uh, we don't use pinhole cameras, or I would say one reason we don't use pinhole cameras. The other reason is that uh, the uh, there's a lot of noise in the forward model because a pinhole camera is obviously very inefficient at collecting the light uh, coming from the remote object because all the light has to go through the pinhole. But uh, we can fix that, and so we're going to do computational imaging and see what we can do to make the throughput of a pinhole camera better. And we'll do that in our next lecture when we talk about coded aperture imaging.